Hi, my name is Thais Gibson, and I'm the co-owner and creator of the Personal Development School. This is your daily breakthrough video, and in this video, I'm going to talk to you about how the dismissive avoidant tends to re-traumatize themselves. Now, I don't mean like this is somebody's fault, you know, just like I've said in the other videos, that this is somebody's fault, it's bad that you're doing this, nothing like this. This is an automatic response that the subconscious mind has when it experiences a traumatic event. Now, to define trauma, we're going to call in the words of Dr. Gabor Mate, if you haven't seen the previous videos, and if you have, it's good to repeat this so the ideas get ingrained because repetition programs your subconscious mind and enhances memory. Um, what you should know is that trauma can be things that didn't happen that should have happened or things that did happen that shouldn't have happened. Did happen that should have happened. Didn't ha did happen that shouldn't have happened, okay? So for example, you're emotionally neglected and we should have a certain degree of emotional attunement and connectedness to our caregivers in order to thrive and, and behaviorally develop effectively. Or if verbal or physical abuse happened, obviously those things shouldn't have happened, okay? And you can think of trauma as just something that we couldn't process the emotional impact of at the time that it took place. And so instead we stored, we got imprinted with, and then we became hyper alert for the potential of this recurring again. Now, in that hyper alertness is also born the repetition of something. So for example, if I'm the dismissive avoidant, and I'm going to go into all of this, but if I'm the dismissive avoidant and I am you know, thinking that something's wrong with me and I've been made to feel ashamed because I can't understand why my caregivers aren't connecting to my emotions, holding space for my emotions. And I, I, the only thing I can do as a child is personalize because that's how children perceive these types of experiences. They, the child can't go, Oh, my caregivers are emotionally unavailable. That's too bad. The child goes, Oh my gosh, there must be something wrong with me. And then in an effort to avoid that, the child grows up to constantly be on the lookout. Like, Oh my gosh, that person might think something's wrong with me or, oh my gosh, I did something embarrassing or silly. Now they're for sure going to think something's wrong with me. And we replay these stories of ourselves because of an old traumatic imprint that happened. And while on one hand, this is effective at keeping us alive because, you know, you can avoid pain and, and there, there are these certain degrees of constituents at a physical level, right? If, if we could remember hundreds of thousands of years ago that there was somebody who tried to kill us at the tree over there down the street. Oh my gosh, be hyper alert for that person. Let's, you know, scan our environment and see if that person's around or that predator, you know, that might've been effective then that doesn't bode well at the emotional level now. And so this is what we're trying to find in our own subconscious web of, of imprinting and trying to isolate and then trying to reprogram so we can transform. And there probably isn't a whole lot more impactful to transform than these specific components. The biggest things that have the strongest impact on your attachment style in terms of, and, and you know, traditional attachment theory doesn't teach this. These are like things that I've done when I, where I've overlapped core wounds and patterns that I've seen in client sessions and a lot of subconscious work I've done with people have overlapped this with attachment styles. So this isn't like attachment theory. This is just something I've noticed about specific individuals as patterns with attachment styles themselves. So, so what I've noticed is that, um, you know, if we can take these big things, if we can take the big unmet needs from our lives and start meeting them, and if we can take the big painful stories and core wounds that we've been telling ourselves because we were imprinted with them and transform them, these are probably the biggest components of anything you can heal. And this doesn't just show up. This isn't just like, Hey, this is going to heal your relationships. No, this is going to heal how you feel at an emotional level on a daily basis. This is going to transform your, your emotional output throughout the course of the day, which obviously can have a massive impact on feelings of depression, anxiety, distress. Um, and this is also going to spill into every single other area of your life. Because when we believe, for example, as the dismissive avoidant does, that something's wrong with me, we don't just believe that in our relationships. We believe that when we make a mistake in front of our colleague at the workplace. We believe that when we do something around a family member. We believe that on a daily basis, when we go to take opportunities, go to you know, go for a job interview, start a business. All of these things touch everything else. They spill into everything. So yes, some of our greatest pain can come from our relationships, but this is also where some of our greatest healing can come from because it's the awareness of the imprints that the relationships had on us at a deep subconscious level and the perceptual filter and persona that we identify with and see the world through and navigate our world through 
And then being able to isolate these things based on what's reflected back to us from the things that hurt us about our interpersonal interactions and use that as a leverage point to really do the inner work and see the golden nuggets of change that need to take place based on the things that are hurting us outside of ourselves. So let's talk about the dismissal avoidance specifically. Before I dive into the specific things of the dismissal avoidance, the specific ways the DA re-traumatizes, we are still still doing a sale to support our community. The coupon code is with you, all one word, um, and it's 25% off membership bundles. I'll put a link in the, the box here to jump in. Um, and we're going to be doing this until stuff like sort of normalizes again. It looked like it was normalizing, and then I know that there's been, you know, more challenges and more closures. And, and, you know, so what I tell people is like, if you, especially if you're in the United States right now, you know, anywhere in the world, of course, but you know, United States, I know there's a lot more things sort of dwindling back down in certain States, things are closing back up. Just take this as an opportunity to work on you and to be with yourself and strengthen the relationship to yourself, because there's no better time to be doing this where like things are rocky and wherever there's a rockiness in life, we have to be even more for the solution than against the problem, right? It's like if somebody gives, if Bob down the street gets a cancer diagnosis, Bob can't afford to ruminate about how terrible this is and how painful it is. It's absolutely a necessity for him to process his emotions and be with himself and grieve. But Bob at the same time has to be starting to be like, okay, what are the solutions I can find? And the more significant a challenge is, the more work we have to put into being for the solution. And so I would say the same thing on a grand scale about what's happening in the world right now. And it doesn't matter like Inside PDS, I would love for you guys to be there. We have an amazing community. We have four live webinars every week. Like there's so much going on, but like whether it's here, whether it's reading books, whatever it is, whatever form it is for you, take the time to sit and do the work on yourself. If you're isolated, if you're stuck at home, good. Walk away from this time having taken something away from it. Okay. Anyways, back to this. How does the dismissal avoidant re-traumatize specifically? So what I often find is that the dismissal avoidant does one of the biggest things is emotionally neglect themselves. Why? Because it's a huge subconscious comfort zone and there's an absence of the emotional intelligence to a certain degree, but really like emotional processing, communicating about emotions, being vulnerable, open, sharing about emotions, making that a part of the personality profile there's an absence of that being modeled to them. And so they, they don't have their, their growth is stunted, stunted there. They haven't had somebody show up and say like, Hey, how are you feeling? How was your day at school? Like, how are you doing today? Oh, I'm feeling this way. What are, you know, they haven't had these open ongoing conversations. So if you don't have any, you know, time put towards something, you're not going to grow and thrive in that area. It's like, if nobody ever teaches you about math, like, you're not going to become a mathematician unless you're actively seeking that stuff out for yourself. Not because you're not capable, but literally because nobody's modeled that to you. You have no resources. It's just blank. Right. And so a lot of dismissive avoidance experience that to a certain degree. And it's so important in the path and process of healing yourselves that you tune into that, that you nurture that part of yourself, that you grow in your emotional awareness and emotional intelligence, that you tune into what you're feeling. You learn to process your emotions, feel about them, learn what feedback they're giving to you. You know, emotions are always the effect of unmet needs or painful stories. That's it. So when we have an experience, we have to be able to go, okay, which one of these is it, or is it both? And how can I work on the underlying constituents that create that emotional output? So I can use my emotions as what they're there for, which are these sacred guide and sacred guidance mechanisms, feedback mechanisms to tell us when something is out of alignment, when something is not right. And when we can have an open relationship with our emotions, where we're excited to get the feedback, we're excited to find the golden nuggets and we're excited to learn about what they're trying to communicate with us. We stop fearing them, right? We stop getting into this space of like, Oh no, it's bad to feel bad. We're like, Oh, I feel bad. Excellent. What is this telling me about myself? What do I need to change? What needs are unmet? What painful thought patterns have I been running or belief patterns are activated and how can I work on those things? And then As a result of that, we start to transform the emotional landscape of our subconscious mind and our emotions level out and balance out. Neurochemistry is impacted as a result because emotions are made up of neurochemical reactions and that shifts as a result of us doing the underlying work. So many beautiful things come out of it. So that's a huge one. Um, 
a lot of dismissal avoidance also usually had some kind of unmet need for, for safety, emotionally specifically, but also physical at times. So they crave that security and stability. So, so make a list, dismissive avoidance. What were my biggest unmet needs in childhood? Sometimes too, it's like to feel accepted, to feel fully seen, to feel understood. Okay. And start doing those things in the relationship to yourself. And most importantly, start opening to others and asking to receive these things. Okay. That is going to be you ending the autopilot repeat pattern of this occurring that just further hardwires in through repetition and emotion, that trauma into your subconscious mind. The other side of this is going to be the component or the part of you that keeps rerunning painful stories based on wounds. So a huge wound, dismissive wounds are always shaming themselves on autopilot. I've had this conversation so many times with different DAs and like, they'll be like, oh yeah, I didn't realize how much I shamed myself first thing when I woke up and started my day. Last thing before I went to bed, the moment I made a mistake, I had somebody say to me recently, I was trying to load groceries into my car and I had too many things in my hand and I dropped something and I just felt like 10 out of 10 shame from people looking at me in the parking lot struggling and thinking, oh, I must be so weak and helpless and small. And, and they were just like shaming themselves. I mean, I don't know if I saw somebody in the parking lot dropping something, I might be like, oh, they need help. I might go offer to help them. Or I might not think twice about it if they're on the other side of the parking lot, you know, I might, or if they pick stuff up quickly and they resolve it, I might be like, oh, geez, that must have been a, a tough load of groceries to carry, but there wouldn't be a part of me that shames somebody else. So it was so interesting to see that that person was doing that to themselves. And usually dismissive avoidance are doing this throughout the day, tens, if not maybe hundreds of times. So be aware of that. Okay. And then um, they're often telling the story that they're unsafe. It's usually in very subtle forms. They're often feeling like they're unworthy or not enough. And usually their coping mechanism for that is to try to push people away and not let anybody define their worth. And they're often feeling like vulnerability is terrible and terrifying and repeating these patterns and stories that keep that wound and that part of their perceptual filter alive. So there are other ones. Um, those are the major ones to start with. Maybe I can do a longer form video about some of the other details, but these are extremely important to be aware of. And I would really work on the, the needs and receiving needs from others and the stories and even asking for validation outside of you to help equilibrate some of those. So ask for acceptance, ask for validation from your loved ones, tell them, Hey, it's important. This is something I'm working through. I'm doing the work internally, but because it's especially applies to my interpersonal relationships. It would be helpful for me to feel like I could receive validation outside of me. And then that dismissive avoidant, you have to sit there and you have to practice receiving. You have to go, okay, I am worthy of receiving acceptance. I do deserve to receive validation or praise. I do deserve to be acknowledged because a lot of times you've even cut off the receiving of that, like a compliment you might deflect. Um, uh, a, a kind, loving gesture, you might be like, oh, it's too much. And really that it's too much or the need to push it away is you not allowing yourself to receive because at a deeper level, you don't feel like that matches your self-worth and how you feel about yourself. So those are very important things to become aware of. Okay. So um, another big one too is like trapped, stuck, telling that story over and over again, but I don't want to like put so much information in one video. So I hope this is easy enough to digest. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you for being here. Please like, share, and subscribe to this channel if you're getting a lot of value. And I will see you in the next video.